<laughs> welcome, 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 everybody. Back to the Drinking Horn Meadcast. Meadcast, 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 Meadcast. <laughs> um, I am absolutely delighted for this episode. I'm, honestly, I'm delighted for every episode. That's true. But this one is, um, we're, we're back to, it's just, it's just me and Evan on the mics. It's been a while. It has. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we did a bunch of episodes with the Brewers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I did. It, you know, you're back. Flavor releases. That's the same. It's really, is, I guess that's true. Yeah. I've been, I've been busy with paperwork. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on with uh, Drinking Horn right now. It's busy. Um, yeah, last. Good things. I mean, good things, is. but but busy. Very busy. Yeah, yeah, great things. Yeah. Um, potential great things, so. Uh, but that's for another episode. It's true. <laughs> um, I have a question for the people out there listening. Um, welcome, everybody, and welcome back if you are a avid listener or just a listener. Um, I have a question. Do you guys ever think of the ramifications of your alcoholic beverage pertaining to water use or land use or basically any of the ecological... Um, I'm going to start that one over. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. It got me thinking, and I had a good. I had a good uh, piece for it. Okay. Well, all of you guys out there, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> um, do you ever think about the repercussions of the alcoholic beverage that you consume? And I'm not talking about physical repercussions, but uh, the the man. I'm just. How about you ask this question? <laughs> We've got a question for all our listeners out there. Um, have you ever contemplated or uh, ruminated on the environmental implications of the beverage that you enjoy? Um, I have. Yeah. So I, I, I tried to grow wheat once. Mm. Wheat uh, with wheat. a tea at the yeah, end. Yeah. I mean, okay. yeah. Well, that's the story this time. <laughs> um, and so I did a. Uh, let's see. It was it was eight foot by eight foot wide by thirty two foot long chunk of the the garden for wheat. Hmm. And um, and granted, this was when I was still doing field work, so I was I was in and out all the time. So it could have been better taken care of, um, but I had this wheat and it, it went all the way through. We got berries, you know. We did the uh, blowing off from the chaff and everything. The winnowing, doing, winnowing, yes, correct. Um, and it was a winnowing situation. Um, <laughs> but I realized after that that uh, I I put a lot of work in and I got. Like three quarters of a loaf of bread, was uh, was all three, that I. Three quarters of a loaf of bread. Yeah, I didn't even get enough flour. I, I had this like bag of berries, you know, wheat berries, and I was like, oh, when I powder them, you know, put them in the Vitamix, like they're gonna they're gonna fluff up, and like they really didn't <laughs> no. at all. And if anything, it was smaller because it was, you know, a lot of dead space inside in between the berries or something. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I had enough flour to make like three quarters of a loaf of bread. And that was. 32 feet by 8 feet of land use yeah. and watering, I'm assuming, oh, quite a bit. Yeah, because we're in the desert. Yeah, we're in yeah. the high desert up here yeah. in Flagstaff, Arizona. What up, Flagstaff, Arizona? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so that brings to mind a, a couple of, of thoughts, um, and I'm, that's a perfect example of, of what we're going to talk about, mm-hmm. and that's water use um, for what you get. Um, and so... Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So you do think about your water use. Mm-hmm. Um, how does how does that tie in to your thoughts about your alcoholic beverage? Actually, that's too that's too much of a. That's, that was direct, right? Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Are you going for a gentler segue? Yeah, yeah, a little bit gentler. Um, so, what Evan asked is, do you ever think about your um, environmental implications of the of the alcoholic beverage or any beverage, but your alcoholic beverage? Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about. And today we're going to talk about the different water uses for different alcoholic beverages. And I just want to start by saying we're not here to, to bash on different alcoholic beverages. Uh-huh. Per se- <laughs> I have to at least say it. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. No, uh, we have lots of friends in the brewing industry. We don't want to, yeah. we don't want to offend any of them too yeah. much. No, and, uh, and it's, these are just facts. These are just thoughts, ideas. Um, I still like to imbibe in, in scotch and whiskey from mm. time to time. Um, I'm forced to drink a beer every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, just, I do want to say we want to, want to uh, address that, that, that we're trying not to bash too hard on people's choices. Right. Uh, we're just giving the information. We're just throwing you out information. What you do with it is up to you. That's right. You know what? You're, if you go into it better educated, then your choices you can feel maybe better about. Right. Yeah. Or worse. Or worse. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, so we're talking about water use, and maybe someone is listening to us in a place where water is plentiful. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're actually in a place where water is annoying because there's so much of it, you know, flooding and right. and that kind of thing. Even though that does actually tie into the drought, uh, you get bigger floods. Um, but when we're talking about water use, uh, we're out here in the West and specifically the Southwest, and a lot of a lot of what well, agricultural production is done out here. Yeah. Um, and so we have. I think you'd have to be living under a rock not to realize that water and drought is a big issue and becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Mm -hmm. um, and over allocation. Yeah, and misallocations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, over allocations is uh, as in reference to the Colorado River. Yeah. Um, into reference of how much water acre feet people can take off of it for their irrigation and kind of what the hierarchy is of, of who can take what first and Oof. it's a yeah it's it's a ugh. yeah that it's would messy be, that would be quite the podcast episode not this that. podcast no no thank goodness um and so yeah we've got drought going on uh we've had drought going on for a while um here in the West, uh, specifically in these Southwest states where we have, you just mentioned the Colorado River, we have Lake Powell, and we've dramatically seen what drought can do, um, the magnitude of what it can do with Lake Powell and how it dropped to levels that were at one point getting very worrisome that that hydro dam would not even function anymore. Yeah. Um, that we couldn't even create electricity with it. Right. Or, or even pull water out for drinking. Or <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, yeah. I think we got, I don't know the exact feet. Somebody can correct me by all means. But I think we got like 25 feet away from the point where we would no longer be able to pull drinking water out for Vegas and stuff like that. Man, that's close. Yeah. Yeah, it got really close. Yeah, and it's kind of somewhat rebounded now. Mm -hmm. Not back to its full, you know, at all. Glory. Yeah, it's full glory. Um, but yeah, drought is, is something we, we have to be careful with our water here in the West everywhere really but um in the west and the southwest and i just had one little stat um this again is not we're not here to like talk about like you know specific drought numbers and projections and all that stuff that would be really cool um, but we're here to talk about mead and, and alcohol beverages and their water use uh, but this just came up on the noaa.gov today like yeah today july 12th it's kind of crazy um but yeah as of july 2024 which is right now Approximately 35% of the U.S. is experiencing moderate to severe drought. 35% doesn't sound like a big number, but we're talking about the entire U.S. And so you're talking about places that are, are not drought um, susceptible as much. Right. And so if you looked at like the states that are drought susceptible, that number would probably be way higher. Yeah. Uh, but 35% of the U.S. is uh, moderate to severe drought. What percentage of the Southwest makes up the U.S.? Probably about 35 percent. That'd be a good quick number. Yeah, so maybe it's just all us. It's pretty much us. And like 100 percent of the Southwest is under moderate to severe drought. That could be scary. Yeah. Like how true that could be. Yeah. Um, so it's an issue. Uh, you can go and, and do your own research about like how big of an issue and how big in your area. But um, I think we can all agree probably that saving water in any sense is a good thing. Yeah. 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 Leaves more of it for the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the grand fishies. And, and the grand, grand deer. Fishies. Yeah. Yeah. And the grand ocelots. Yeah, I'm worried about those. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the Kawatamundis. <laughs> oh, Kawatamundi. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. They need to make a movie about a Kawatamundi. Yeah. So how has there not been a movie about a Kawati yet? Disney's probably all over it. Yeah. Pixar. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so water is an issue. Um, so now we're gonna just kind of talk about uh, about water and water use and and why mead should be a part of your drinking beverage arsenal if you are at all concerned about about uh, water conservation. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Nice. So um, when you were started, I just want to kind of start with this question to you, Evan. When you started the meadery. Um, were you knowledgeable about this aspect of mead at all? Like I'm talking about when you first were thinking about making mead and no, started making mead. I wouldn't say so. I don't think I was, was aware of uh, the, the minimal water usage that it takes for production of mead. Um, I think you know water usage um, has been a huge part of my life. Um, being a fish biologist, you know, fish, fish need water. Um, 
They do, don't they? Yeah, it's one of the biggest things I learned. I wrote a paper about it, actually. <laughs> yeah, nice. uh, Yeah, fish need water. Uh, so it was always something that was pretty important, um, as well as just kind of um, growing up in the Southwest, growing up where you get evacuated for fires and everything else. It's, it's always been kind of an important part of, of, of my life. Hmm. Water. Because water is life. It is, yes. Yeah. But I had no idea, like, how good need was about usage of water. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's because uh, it's not out there. Like yeah. I don't, I don't remember ever. I mean, I've been in the alcohol industry for a little while now, um, same as you, and I don't. It's not a conversation that's really had. No. Uh, not for any. I don't think not for any purposeful reasons. Like no one's hiding any of this. Right. I don't think so. I don't know, but mm -hmm. um, it's always a little conversation about just saving water in the mm -hmm. in the brewing industry, just because it, it's something that we all should do in all of our industries. Yeah. In life. But as far as specifically, like which alcoholic beverage you're choosing to think about, I've never heard that conversation. No, and I think honestly where it, where it kind of came from uh, for me when I started noticing it anyway was that like um, the, the warehouse that we rent here, um, they wanted us to have our own water meter because they, the, the folks that we rent it from were concerned that our usage would be a greater usage than the other warehouses around us. <laughs> um, and they're all on the same water meter. And so they wanted us to be able to have our own separate water meter, which is, a, you know, you have, to, you have to pay a plumber to put those things in and, and all that whatnot. Mm. Um, but that's when we started looking at it, just because of, just out of curiosity of like, well, how much, how much water are we using per batch? And looking at how many batches are we going through per month versus how much gallonage are we using per month? And then kind of coming up with some numbers that was like, holy cow, like it's, it's pretty minimal. Um, and kind of went from there, because then you start learning about I mean, just the cleaning methods and the, all the aspects of production that are not just like what ends up in your glass, but are crucial to that point. You mm -hmm. um, kind of start putting numbers together and it was, it was eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into that here in just a little bit about like that production side of things and the water use. But that is something that people don't think about. You just think about like, how much water does it take? Well, you know, how much mead do you have? Like right. you, you add honey to water and that's how much water you use, but there's a lot more to it. And maybe, I don't think this is the case, but, like, I came over from brewing in a warehouse, like, brewing beer, mm -hmm. and then came over here, and I know for me, it was eye-opening at that point, when I saw the, what it takes in the, in the back here, uh, how little water it takes here compared to over at the brewery. We don't wear rubber Holy boots. Cow. Yeah, I have. We had. <laughs> we don't wear rubber boots in our production. We don't. And like breweries, breweries, they all wear you know some sort of muck boot or rubber boot. Oh yeah. Because it's just everything's wet all the time because you're just the, the process. Yeah, yeah, and I just I, and I want to get to this after we talk about the first step, but um, just saying that the boots reminds me too. We don't have a floor drain in this. We don't have a floor drain. That, if you said that to any brewer of of beer that we don't have a floor drain in here, they'd be like, your life must be hell. And we're like, no, we, we don't need it. No, don't need it. <laughs> you know what I do need, though? What's that? Oh, my gosh, what are we doing? <laughs> what's wrong? I'm looking over at TikTok right now. What is wrong with this glass? This, this might be our, tell me this might be our last glass? minute on TikTok before they kick us off. Oh, yeah, that's Sorry. true. Hmm, interesting. Oh, Caledonia. Yeah, so right now uh, Evan is grabbing our latest batch of mead. Um, this is a... Oh, that was a beautiful sound. It's like that. Um, he is opening it. I'm giving a visual here. He is opening it with a... Is, that a spe is there a specific name for that? Axe? Oh, there probably is. I mean, I could make something up. But yeah, that's a, a Rufinier. Yeah, perfect. Rufinier? <laughs> I don't... It's, it's got two sides. One side of the axe is large, and the other side is, is like a mini axe. It's like a mini axe. It's like a little mini axe. axe. A little mini axe. <laughs> um, but anyway, this, this batch of mead uh, was just bottled on Wednesday, Tuesday. Oh, wait. I know you want this for the audio. Oh, yeah. All right. Everybody listen to me as well. Oh, my gosh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Could you hear that deliciousness? Um, yeah, I think this was uh, bottled on Tuesday and released on Wednesday. So this is this three week. days old. Yeah, yeah, yeah this, this week. week. Uh, so Caledonia, uh, you want to talk a little bit about <laughs> this while I take a yeah. drink? You went, to, you went to go take a drink and I was like, hey, I haven't talked about this because I'm going to drink. Well, let me cheers you first. Oh, uh, skull. 
Skull. Skull. Uh, so Caledonia is actually the, the Roman name for most of what is now currently called Scotland. Um, and we were kind of trying to make something that was a little bit um, an ode to the Highlands, basically. And so chamomile is something that's extremely popular and grows very easily. I think it's from Scotland. Mm. Um, vanilla, not so much, but you know, but we like delicious. to we like to culture blend. Yeah. So we've got uh, chamomile, Ooh. tea, vanilla, uh, real vanilla beans. So so chamomile tea, real. We I've got over there a bag of some of the leftover chamomile, and it's like flowers. Like we use yeah, flowers. actual flowers and steep them. Right, so it's kind of funny because we call it chamomile tea, oh, I but it's not. Think about it's that. not technically a tea. What? It, it's herbal tea. I guess we still call that tea. A tea might be a term of anything that any plant that's steeped into a liquid. I don't know. We'll have oh, to look up man. some specific definitions. Yeah, this is where we need y'all's help. I wish I could. I wish I could. Right. Does tea have to be tea leaves, or can we? Can can an herbal? It's like an herbal hot water tincture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because like using dandelion flowers, like you call that dandelion tea or dandelion wine, I guess. Never mind. Um, mm. Anyway, we use real chamomile flowers. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's probably not even called chamomile flowers. It, it, Maybe they're just chamomile. Is chamomile the name of the plant? So, oh, ladies man. and gentlemen, now we're looking dumb. <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> oh, I love this. I love how we actually know this stuff, but we we're really good actors, acting like we don't know this stuff. Yeah, we're just shooting for interaction, folks. <laughs> yeah, engaging. Tell us what. Tell us where we're wrong. Uh, so we've got these organic uh, chamomile flowers that we used, and then um, organic vanilla beans um, that we uh, opened up, scraped, cut up, uh, put in there, and steeped. Uh, post fermentation, mm -hmm. and what is special about this honey? It's just Flagstaff wildflower honey. Yeah. So we we've used Flagstaff wildflower honey in a couple of blends before, but we've never done a mead with just straight up Flagstaff wildflower honey. Um, and so it, it's a really really light in color. I mean, almost clear. Um, it's very very light. So you know, orange blossom honey definitely ends up with a more um, sort of an orangey sort of like a darker hue um, to it when you ferment it. But this one is very, very blonde, um, and it is quite delicious. I mean, part of the idea behind this mead is that we wanted to come up with a summer methaglin. Um, we have a lot of fans out there who are big fans of our, our methaglin that comes out in the fall and don't want to drink anything else and are very sad for the rest <laughs> of the year until we come out with another methaglin. Um, and this meth this is a methaglin, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's something, but it, we wanted a summertime methaglin. We wanted something that was that you could drink on a hot day. Yeah. And uh, boy, that is delicious. So it's yeah. very, very low sugar content. Um, I think finishing sugar on it was like 10.08. Really? Um, so wow. it's, it's damn near dry. It, it would be considered dry if we submitted it for like uh, competitions. It would be considered a dry mead. That, um, that con it's funny, it both surprises me and doesn't at the same time. Because as I'm drinking this, when you first said that, I'm like, no way, because I'm getting that kind of sweetness. But then I'm like, when I stop and actually think about it and feel it on my tongue, I'm like, no, no, this is a dry mead. Mm -hmm. Like, so I think the 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 vanilla might be playing that role of of tricking me into thinking there's. That I think vanilla does there. that, yeah, for sure. Because like, you don't drink like bitter vanilla things generally. Like vanilla is kind of always one of those flavors associated with sweet. But that's why meads yeah. taste sweet a lot of times when they aren't. It's just because that honey flavor is so associated with sweet, mm -hmm. um, even when the sugar content is all actually gone. Yeah, I, I always tell that to people. When you're drinking mead, um, you think it's very high in sugar, but it's, it's surprisingly not as high as you would think because honey hits the tongue differently. It's, it's, so much of it is a single sugar molecule, a monosaccharide, glucose, mm -hmm. um, that I think that just like, like um, attaches to your tongue molecules or whatever sciencey kind of thing there and gives that sweetness whereas uh, sucrose which is like your table sugar is a disaccharide and needs to be broken down first till it's sweet um, and so you need less honey to be just as sweet wait yeah did that make sense no no you had that right okay yeah you need, you need <laughs> less honey to well and I think too like there's you know like when you look at like a coca-cola or something like that with 44 grams of sugar in a 12 ounce can I mean that's half the can um, but all the they do acid balances and stuff like that too and so even in 
even in beers, there's a lot of beers that are on the sweeter side as far as the sugar content goes, but we don't associate grain sweetness with like sugary sweetness, even though it is a sugar. Um, and so you don't, you don't necessarily taste how much sugar something has, um, or you can overtaste how much sugar something has, just kind of based off the flavor of it. I love Nick's trying to read all the, the Tiki Takis right now, the comments, and his head's all sideways as he's looking at it. <laughs> um, so it's something that's, it's cracking me up a little bit. Yeah, it probably looked really funny right there on the TikTok. I'm like a, like a dog, like looking like, like a, a funny sound tilting their head. Um, yeah, uh, and we got a, I was looking at, try, I'm trying to, trying to multitask here, and I got a, a question on TikTok, um, and we'll definitely address it in just a little bit. Um, they asked, what is the approximate gallons uh, of, of water, com- like, compared, used oh, to compare? Data. Yeah, we got, we got numbers for you. We got Nick, numbers. Nick yeah. actually just recently did a whole talk on this, and uh, so we have some pretty up-to-date numbers, and we'll talk about some of the reasons that there's variances and some of these other things. Um, there's a lot of different types of water use for agricultural production, and that can play a huge, huge role huge. into things. Um, yeah, so I'll, yeah. I'll let you lead, lead the charge. All right, cool. Well, thanks for opening up that bottle of Caledonia. Mm, Available right now uh, at the Mead Hall, online for shipping to 38 states, and um, on its way currently to different bottle shops and places around the state. If you are in Arizona, and your bottle shop does not have it, uh, we were just reminded about how well it works if you just ask them, uh, that bottle shop. Um, they, are, yeah. they are super willing. They, they want to know what you're gonna buy. They right. want you to buy it. Yeah. You, know, you, don't, you sometimes don't think about that, like you're bothering them or something, like, oh, could you carry this mead by drinking horn? Like, it's super easy for them to be like, oh, are you gonna buy it? Sweet, of course I'll, I'll order it. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that made sense. We got we got that very sweet email uh, mm-hmm. from one of our customers, one of our one of our clan, um, about uh, one of the locations down in Phoenix that just was. Mm-hmm. I was I, I blushed, I blushed. Yeah, it was super sweet. Uh, they talked about how nice they were about uh, having our mead and explaining it and how they had like all of our mead right there up front and yeah, it was it was cool to hear. Yeah, it's nice. It's awesome when our retailers take a lot of pride, as much pride as we do. Yeah. You know, in, in us in making the product and them in carrying it is. <laughs> it's a weird side note, but it, it does it does make sense for bottle shops to carry someone like us, like to put us on a shelf kind of in the in the eye, you know, up front, because we're a new product that people might not know about. Right. If you put like Jack Daniels up front, like like people know Jack Daniels. If they're coming in for whiskey and Jack Daniels, they're gonna find it even if it's back in a weird kind of corner. What is this bourbon you speak of? Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, yeah, let's get into let's get into the, to the meat and potatoes of the episode. Cool. Oh man, I'm, I'm kind of, it's kind of daunting a little bit. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, I did give a talk on this not too long ago. Yeah. Um, but all right, so we'll break this down into two kind of sections. Uh, the first section. We'll talk about the water use pre-production, like before we you okay. <laughs> upstream costs. We'll call it, yeah, upstream, upstream water usage. Yeah. So before the honey gets to us, or before the barley or wheat gets to the brewery, or before the w- grape juice gets to the winery or the grapes, there are, there's a lot of water use potential upstream. Right. Cool. And there and there can be depending. I'm going to throw a wrench in it here because there can ah! be there can be with honey depending on where that honey is sourced from. Hmm. So that could that some of those numbers can increase hmm. um, when you're talking about something like Flagstaff wildflower honey or mesquite honey out of the desert, which is some of my favorite honey. Hmm. Um, any of those, like it's for the bees to create that honey, they're using no additional water basically. Um, because it's all coming from from desert wildflower plants that are just doing whatever they can with the rain yeah. or lack of rain. They're not irrigated. Not irrigated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's uh, so yeah. Let's talk about about that. So the agricultural use of water to create the fermentable sugar right. is what we're talking about. All alcoholic beverages, I think, all alcoholic beverages need a source of sugar for the yeast to turn into ethanol. That's what it's yeast does. They turn a sugar source, they do their magic, and it turns into ethanol mm-hmm. and CO2 and 
Um, we don't even know how it works. It's just magic. Yeah, it is. I took a whole the chemistry of brewing <laughs> class from Oklahoma University. I still don't understand it. It's magic. <laughs> it's magic. Yeah, that's all they needed to say. So you need some kind of fermentable sugar. Uh, what we do is, as humans, is we use agricultural products uh, to give those sugars to the yeast. Um, what I'm basically doing is trying to make it really fancy. Wine uses grape juice, grapes and grape juice. Beer uses barley or wheat or some kind of grain. Mm -hmm. um, sake uses rice. Gin or uh, vodka uses potatoes. And then I'm not going to continue, you know, tequila uses agave. It must take a lot of potatoes for vodka. Yeah. It just doesn't seem, I guess the starch is sugar just in another form. Yeah. And so you just break down that starch into a sugar and then into yes, yes, yes. alcohol. Yeah, you need some kind of amylase. Just, just trying to imagine a potato is a sack filled with sugar. Basically, yeah. Mm. Yeah, just like little kids yeah. on Halloween with their sacks of sugar. And the sacks of sugar. <laughs> so I, I came from a family um, that were wheat farmers. Oh. And we weren't like fancy wheat farmers. We were like broke wheat farmers. Oh. So we, uh, we used what's <laughs> called dry land farming. Mm. So we just relied entirely, and this is like from my family from like Dodge City, from back in Kansas. Yeah, okay. Um, and this is, um, we relied entirely on precipitation yeah. to, to grow the that's fields. That's crazy. Um, and yeah, it, well, and it's, I mean, not, living in it's Arizona, not super that's productive. Crazy. Yeah, it's not super productive. So, mm. so my family would get like per acre, they would get, I don't know, I think it's like three to six bushels per acre. Um, whereas if you irrigate, you get like mid-20s. Mm you know, 24, 28 bushels per acre, um, depending on the year, depending on the grain. Of course, of course. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but it was just, you know, it took, it, you would get four times the production out of using irrigation. Um, and so I just bring it up in the sense of like to give, to give some beers the benefit of the doubt on the water usage that if they're using grain specifically from folks that do dry land farming, um, which is probably not many because like no. that, dry land farming was only something that small family farms did and what that makes up like less small family farms make up less than like five percent or or probably probably even less than that now of the agricultural products that we consume um going going further in the direction of mass corporations using these things and they are not um nearly so concerned with the water they use just about how much they can produce mm -hmm. um, yeah i would uh, man if there are any breweries out there using dryland farmed wheat, um, hit us up. They should. It, that should be well, well known and super advertised. Yeah. I don't know if that's even possible. I mean, home brewers maybe. It maybe would, tiny, micro, micro, nano breweries. It would make tiny, it so expensive. So expensive. Like you're, the, automatically, your wheat would cost four times what it does right now. Yeah. People don't like a twenty percent oh, increase oh in cost. I, it pisses I think them that off number is way higher. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's not not likely. Yeah, so that's a great that's a great uh, topic. We'll just stick with that with with the agricultural use and the water use there because I so coming from a brewery, I've only I've, I've only been with one brewery, um, but like I have gone to many many breweries for collaborations <laughs> in the brew house and stuff like. No, I don't mean yeah. I mean I've gone to many breweries and drink, but I meant I've been in the in the brewing facilities of excuse me um, many many uh, breweries, and. I'll tell you what, like everything, everything, almost, not, not everything, almost every grain bag I saw was imported. So this is, or like not, not domestic, like not from the U S uh, not. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, a lot was imported. Yeah. Not from the U S. Gotcha. Um, but I guess I mean like these were large companies. Oh yeah. So these are not dryland farmers. There's, there's very few small wheat farmers. Yeah. And so there's there, no money in there are people that are doing it. So, you know, Arizona wilderness and Sedona Beer Company uh, here in Arizona, those are two that I know of, there might be more, um, try to use as much, if not exclusively, um, a local Arizona uh, brand of wheat. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's white, oh man, Sonoran white wheat, I think is what it's called. Cutting down on transportation distance. Oh, we'll talk that's about, huge, I want right? to talk about that a little too, even though it's yeah. water, yeah. yeah. So, Should we be writing all these things down so we don't have another episode where we talk about all the things we want to talk about but don't talk about? Uh, I mean, we probably should, but I'm not eh, going to. I mean, why <laughs> broke it? Why, why fix it why if it broke it? Break? Why broke it if it ain't break? Why broke it if it ain't fixed? <laughs> oh. Oh, um, yeah, so, okay. Caledonia is strong. I know. It's <laughs> the Caledonia is strong in this one. <laughs> it is delicious. I'm drinking this faster than any other Meatcast episode, I think. Uh -oh. um, yeah, so, okay, let's think about this. So, we're kind of... 
I love this. I love the tangents. Um, you need to grow an agricultural product in order to make the alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. For these, for beer, it's uh, barley and wheat. Like, I, I've repeated this already, but for wine, it's grapes. Um, and then you can just choose whatever other distilled spirit they're using, either potatoes, rice, barley, corn, something like that. These are all agricultural products that, as we just established, need irrigation mm -hmm. to, on the most part. Yeah, absolutely. On any, like, larger scale, mm -hmm. uh, medium to larger scale. When you look at mead, I, I want to talk about both the fact that they don't use any agricultural product, but then in a sense they kind of do. We do, we do. We, we use it, but, but then I want to you know, talk right. about how the, it almost it nullifies itself. Because the water usage for our traditional mead is going to be much less than for, say, strawberry. Yes. Strawberry is probably the worst. Strawberries are pretty water intensive. But we also don't use, and, and stop me if I'm, if I'm jumping ahead on you here, um, but like we don't use a lot of fruit for, if you, for anybody out there that's drank our mead, um, you know that we don't ferment a lot of the fruit. Oh, like, like. So like we use not. fruit as more of a flavor to, to change the mead as opposed to fermenting the entirety of it out. And we do ferment a little bit of every fruit that goes in, um, just to, I mean, you, you can't really avoid it. When you put fruit into a batch, it's going to chew through some of that sugar um, before we get a chance to put it through our methods that make it shelf stable. Um, so, like, it's it's going to ferment a little bit, but primarily we're using it as a, as a flavor because, mm -hmm. I don't know, it tastes better that way. I think so, yeah. So does everyone else, pretty much. That... Train? Train. Train. <laughs> Just looked around, heard the train. Um, it was either that or a thunderstorm. Cause it's oh, that's outside. why you were interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I got excited. I was hoping for another. Uh, well, I was hoping for another moment when we get a thunderclap right at the Ooh, right time, like that yeah. episode, many, many, many moons ago. Mm, episode number like seven, I think. See, I was gonna say six. So oh. we're, we're somewhere right in there. Yeah. There's two in a row. Maybe seven. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So we use fruits um, in some fruit fruit juice in some of our meads. Um, but we haven't done numbers on that. I don't know, like, you know, the percentage of, like, gallons needed for a bucket. Like, we'd have to look into it for sure. Yeah, but we basically use but usually one bucket yeah. of juice. Um, so to be, to be, for the future, we'll figure that. This, <laughs> I, I, I want to say also that all this information that we'll be giving these numbers and, like, these ideas and thoughts are, in a sense, pretty new. Like, people aren't really studying this that much. Um, they're studying the water use on beer. They're studying the water use on wine, that kind of thing. They're not really studying the water use on mead because mead is, you know, it's not known that much right now. No, it's still so new. So new. So, um, yeah, but to, to rewind just a little bit, we're, we're not, oh, bumping the microphone there. We're not, uh, bump it up, bump, bump it up. We're not using, um, our fermentable sugar is honey mm -hmm. and as people know, bees fly to the flower of a plant, get the pollen and nectar, bring it back, and then do their magic. We, we talked about that in other episodes, maybe in the future too, about the specifics of that. I won't go into that. But they basically then go and create the honey in the hive. Mm -hmm. from, from just that. Uh, and also like finding little puddles and drinking water or whatever. But, yeah. like, but you don't water your bees. You don't That's water the point your you're bees. getting to. That's called drowning the bees. Yeah, you don't... You, you can... You could like supply them with a little pan of water if you wanted to, but you're not using water in any sense to create the honey. Right. The fermentable sugar for right. our product. They can they can get enough water from drinking dew off of grass every morning. <laughs> yeah. <It's... sighs> Can't we all? Mm. No. So just thinking about that. So we'll think upstream. Um, we're not using water to irrigate a product um, to create the honey. Now. We have orange blossom honey as our main honey, mm -hmm. and that comes from orange trees, and the orange trees are irrigated, but I say that negates itself because that water is being used to produce the oranges, not the right. honey. Right. So it's a net zero use of water, as far as irrigation of for the fermentable sugar is concerned, for the production of our yeah, I agree. Our product. Because like it's like I said earlier, like you you know, you have the orange blossom and so yes, like the orange orchards use a lot of water. Um, but you would not you don't need the orchard to create honey. Yeah. You you can have your bees in a desert with no water around and they will still create honey. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's to me, and, and I would love to sit down with anyone who wanted to like, you know, do a, a point counterpoint of that yeah. saying that to create our fermentable sugar, it's a net zero water use. Yeah. As compared to other ones. Right. Because you, water is involved in other well, things. Well, there's a whole like, other product that's made from it. Whereas like the yeah. water that you use to grow the grain yeah. for beer, that's it. You grew the grain that then gets fermented. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's it. Like yeah. there, the, there is no other byproduct that is benefiting from that situation. So yeah. it's, so I, I agree with you. It's funneling the, funneling the water usage. Yeah. Yep. And like I said, it's so new with these numbers and these ideas that like, I, I'd love to, we'll eventually in years de- to come do an episode where we have more information on this. Oh, wow. Um, Your new numbers are actually even bigger than uh, the numbers that I had always previously told people. Yeah. The sign we have that, yeah. that, um, that like big sign that says save water, drink me needs to be updated. Yeah. Um, this is much so, scarier. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give people out there numbers here. Uh, so agriculture, uh, barley and hops, um, are like, you know, for beer, um, I'm not going to go over this again. Two main, Grapes, two main ingredients. Stuff. So for one gallon of beer, uh, to be produced, uh, ag- this is the agriculture side. This is not in this the, is not the production this portion. Is not, yeah. This is just to grow the stuff that goes into fermentation. Exactly. So for agriculture, one gallon of beer takes 590 gallons of water. All right. So my previous gallons. number was like I think I would always tell people when I talked about it, like three to four hundred mm-hmm. gallons of water. Yeah. Um, but five hundred and ninety, basically six hundred. Yeah. So one gallon of beer takes six hundred gallons of water yeah. daily to make. And I don't know, but I think maybe what you might have been missing in that number, or maybe it just got, you know, updated, was the hops part of it. Oh, I think you're right, because I was just looking at grain. Yeah. So this is I wasn't looking at the herb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So barley and hops. This comes from, and I, I will put up on our show notes, um, the, uh, the, uh, what are the I references, remember? the references. Thank you. Yeah. So this comes from the public policy Institute of California, 590 gallons of water for one gallon of beer. We got footnotes, fools. <laughs> I'm science teacher for nine years. And that guy was doing science for how many ever years on the river. Science. So, uh, now let's go to wine. Wine for one to produce one gallon of wine on the agriculture side, so the grape side. <laughs> Holy cow! Eight hundred and seventy gallons of water. That's a lot. Oh. Eight hundred and seventy gallons of water from. To but that, the it makes sense because you know grapes are juicy. Yeah, and, and they're you want, dry climate. And you want they're almost always grown dry. I was thinking that as you were reading that that like, you know, we grow a lot of grapes in Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the areas in California where they grow grapes are far enough inland from the coastal stuff that like they're not they're, they're relatively arid climates yeah like what like a Mediterranean climate kind yeah of thing I think that would be yeah. fair yeah so that was that was 870 gallons of water to one gallon of wine that is from uh, the Union College of Sustainability and the Sonoma County oh. Gazette so Sonoma is like, Sonoma is where <laughs> is where Napa Valley is yeah so they're they're not they're you know, not trying to tweak this on that on the big side at all. No, no. If anything, those kind of a uh, study from people living in that area would want to tweak it down. They want to <laughs> they want to turn it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, for distilled spirits, I, I, I think you can make it so easy. different. They are, but I mean, the biggest thing is that a distilled spirit is a cooked down beer. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, I like at its most simplistic. That's that's way oversimplifying no, no, the, the art and the technique that goes into yeah. making the whiskey. <laughs> yeah. But you're um, absolutely right. So Canyon Canyon Diablo, don't be angry with us. Um, <laughs> we're not we're not trying to minimize that in any way, shape, or form. But it is um, basically if a if a gallon of beer has five percent alcohol content, and it's usually it goes a little higher for folks when they're making when they're making whiskey and stuff like that. Usually like eight. Um, but I'm going five because that's an easy number. Um, to make a gallon of whiskey, which would be four liters, uh, I don't know how many fists that is, so many different measurements off the top of the head, but you're basically, you're going to multiply whatever water you used for beer, just for the grain portion, so mm-hmm. that, that 300 gallons of water per gallon of beer, and then you multiply it times, I don't know, to get 40% whiskey, you would basically be multiplying it times eight yeah. So you could be looking at... To cook off that water. Yeah. I mean, the number that I had in my head from, from many moons ago was that it was like 1,200 gallons of water. Yeah. 
but that's more of the production end of it. So I don't want to mix those numbers into because this is yeah. just the agriculture end of it. Yeah, which would be very similar to beer, right? Um, because they're using for, for I guess that's true. It would be the exact same as beer, basically, but minus the hops because yeah. nobody's going to bother putting hops into. Do they? No, no. Okay. But I, my look was. Uh, Corn, is corn more water intensive than barley? Because bourbon uses 50% or more of corn. I don't know that. I don't know Maybe that someone either. out there. We love engagement. Man, if you corn guys hear juicy. us say something that's that's off and you know it's off, please yeah. let us know. We're, we're all about informing each other, informing the public, yeah. um, informing our customers, yeah. informing our clan. <laughs> just, in, just more information, more better. Yeah, we, so won't, we won't ever take it personal. Oh, God, no. 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 So, um... But corn does have the juice. <laughs> oh man, oh that's a throwback. Is, oh, yeah. is it a throwback if it's like if less it's not than five years old? I think so. It's corn. <laughs> it's got the juice. <laughs> that is true. So anyway, I don't. Ha I couldn't find numbers uh, easily referenced for how much, how many gallons it takes. But it's very close to beer. Um, but then you're right when we talk about production side, it just skyrockets. Skyrockets. Okay, so simply thinking. We don't have to grow a specific product to create the fermentable sugar for agricultural production. So we are at, it's very easy to just or basically say zero. zero. Yeah. yeah. So right there, that alone is nuts and bolts, as, mm -hmm. Marcus, as Marcus Manville would say. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, cool. So, all right, that's part one. Yeah. Um, so right now, I'd say mead's kicking ass. <laughs> Mead. You're killing it. Good job, Mead. Yeah. So uh, we had a quick question um, in, yeah, yeah. in there, and uh, it kind of ties to this, but uh, I just want to throw it out there, today, and I don't know the answer, and I don't think... Was it? Was it is Evan this. even talking, or is he just whispering into the microphone? No. Because sometimes I do that. Oh, okay. It's very ASMR. Yeah. Uh, so the question was... The whisper, the whisper cast. Is there a terroir difference in Mead, a.k.a. if it's grown somewhere? The mead? <laughs> yeah. Wait, I'm confused. Okay, so grapes are, or uh, wine is known for having a terroir. Yeah, appellation of origin. Yes. Yes. Um, so I have to fill that out every time I do a TTB colon. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I don't know if orange trees in central and southern Arizona honey is different than orange trees in California because the soil is different. That's a crazy question that I it's just a don't know. It's a crazy good question. Cra I, yeah, I would I meant crazy immediately. <laughs> I would immediately assume yes. Sorry if you hear the clunking with my, yeah. oh. my poor hands. <laughs> um, I would immediately assume yes, right? Because mm -hmm. what makes a terroir or like an appellation of origin or any sort of however you want to phrase the flavors of the land yeah. is basically what you could call that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those are all based off of like what type of dirt is making up the soil. So like how much clay does it have, how much everything else, which makes a difference on how well it holds nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, um, which will also make a difference, that, you know, the, the, the soil content will make a difference then on the pH of the soil. Um, and so I would say absolutely, because those things are going to affect whatever you're growing, wherever you're growing, whether it's, you know, grapes or grain or oranges or kumquats. Um, are all going to end up with a slightly different flavor based on the soil that they're grown in. Mm. Yeah. Um, now those might not be recognized, right? So with mead, um, we don't get to use appellation of origin on there. We don't uh, get to utilize so much that part of things um, because we don't have recognized flavor profiles for geographic locations with honey. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we get I to didn't know that stuff. We get to kind of like they don't know what to do with us. So that's why we put Arizona <laughs> in a lot of those, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just like, well, our honey comes from here, so Arizona. Yeah. But like, there's I don't know the number, but there's at least like thirty different um, distinct areas just in Arizona that are recognized as producing slightly different flavors and stuff. In reference to wine. Yes. Oh wow. Yes. Okay. Arizona's becoming big in wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got the, the area down in uh, Sonoida. Um, yeah. I mean, we've always had like Page Springs and Cottonwood area, um, the Verde Valley kind yeah. of area, and now Sonoida as well over the past, like, uh, 
I say now, but like 10 years or so, it's been like kind of blown up. So little bird, just, little bird told me that Rimrock is about to get a massive winery. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Little oh. birds. Oh. Chirp, chirp. Or it was a dream. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> hey, dreams, birds, dream birds, bird dreams. Yeah. Bird brain. Bird brain. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. Well, that was a good question. Um, one that we couldn't really answer, but I, I kind of learned something about the Appalachian of origin. So, the yeah. origin of Appalachian yeah. origin. It's also why Mead isn't allowed to put um, something in that. I have to go and relook it up again. But it's why we're not allowed to put dates, vintning dates, onto our bottles either. Oh. Because it's. Uh, you mean like a year? Yeah. Okay, so like you're like. Oh man, I just love the 2016 Pinot from, you know, right, whatever. Right. Oh, okay. So we, we were not allowed to, all because of that same sort of appellation of origin. Um, so what the heck does a year have to do with? Because the year and the location oh. are going to vary because of that same thing that we're talking about, primarily rain. Yeah, rain, um, humidity, that's right. They're like, it was a dry fires. year, so it made, yeah. you know, this kind of... A all those, all those, I've heard, and I haven't had the opportunity to taste any of these because um, the bottles are expensive, you know, but some of the yeah. wines that came out of the Sonoma County, Napa Valley area um, during when they had all their fires up there had a very, very distinct flavor to them. Mm. Not just smoky. That's that's what I think they are. <laughs> and I said that, and somebody was like, well, no, not exactly. Yeah. Um, but there's, so you can get your hands on some of those. And so that year tied along with the location or relative location can kind of give you an idea possibly of what sort of profile, flavor profile that you would be looking at in a bottle of wine. Gotcha. Gotcha. That totally makes sense. You know what Vikings didn't care about? Um, Appalachian of origin. Nope. Nope. <laughs> and or maybe I, they did. You know what? I'm not going to talk, speak yeah, for the Vikings. We shouldn't speak for the, for the Norse. We shouldn't speak for them. No. But uh, I tend to think that, like, if it tastes good, drink it. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't taste good... Still drink it. But whine about it. <laughs> yeah. Like that wine. Oh. Oh. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, man, lots of great information in these episodes. In this episode. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to chunk this out and, uh, and share some of it. I am so sorry, TikTok, if I am not getting to your questions. Um, it is just... It's the nature of the beast. We're give me, give me something to talk about, and you can look through your questions. Okay, um, the Ooh, ramifications production. of post World War II. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness! No, um, that when your country doesn't get bombed to oblivion, you have a better economy afterwards. Yeah, the terroir of. Huh. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna edit that one out, probably. <laughs> yeah, should I put it down? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, we talked about agriculture. Um, that is part one of two in the production of an alcoholic beverage. Uh, and then the second part that now we'll, we'll talk about is actual production. And, and what I mean by that is in, say, the warehouse behind us, in the brewery, um, where you take your raw fermentable sugar product and create alcohol uh, your final product. Right. So production, that's what I mean by production. Everything that it takes to go from raw materials, being honey, grape, or grain, to you drinking it. Yeah, yeah, into a bottle. Uh, or potato or rice. Or potato or rice. Or, um, uh, uh, whoa. <laughs> Ugh, I got excited. This is a really uh, bad spot for Or, you. um, gosh, some people make, what is that? Like, uh, like basically sugar. Like, you just take sugar, um, sugar, like, uh, not Gatorade. What am I thinking? It was like, kind of people were talking about Seltzer? it. Seltzer? You can like, because you can ferment any sugar. Any you know, sugar. You just add sugar, I mean, yeast to sugar, water. Um, man, I can't remember what it was, but they were basically using just sugar water. What's a sugar water besides Gatorade? Um, Coke? Kool-Aid? Kool-Aid? Yeah. I think Mountain Kool Dew? Was. Mountain Dew. Are you thinking of that meadery that made the Mountain Dew meat? I wasn't, but now I am. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, here we go. Uh... <laughs> Production. So you've got your barley, your grapes, um, you've got your you know, honey, your fermentable sugar. You go into production. Now, in... Let me look at my notes here. Oh, I've got the numbers, but let's kind of base it or give a little background here. Um, some of the things that we do here in the meadery are going to be different than what you would do in a brewery. And like you talked about, would be way different than in a distillery. Right. So there's a lot of differences, and I don't think we'll probably be able to hit every one of them, um, but we'll try to, to hit some of them here. 
So I'll start, I guess, with um, let's let's start with the metery, and then we'll go. We'll backtrack. Um, I think that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. So something that was a big surprise to me, I think I mentioned this before, coming from a brewery to a metery, was the water use back here um, in in production. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest differences is that we don't need to extract the sugars from the raw material, the honey. No, no they're readily available. Yeah, exactly. No, no, amylase, no amylase needed. Exactly. We don't need to break down the honey to extract the sugars. Mm -hmm. what I'm, why I'm bringing that up is you do have to do that in brewing and distilling, in, right. in beer and, and spirits. And in, and in modern days, it's something that you can just buy the, uh, mm. what is it called? What is amylase called? Oh. It's a, like it's chemical compound name. Like it's a, it's a, amylase is a fill in the blank for me. Uh, an enzyme? Enzyme. There oh, we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an enzyme that breaks sugars that are like long chains of sugars. It breaks it into single and right. single sugars. Which you can buy just that enzyme and add it into the, the grain. But back in the day to make beer, you you had to you chewed up some grain and would spit it in, right? <laughs> Check because we have we have that same enzyme in our spit because obviously mm -hmm. we, we eat things like potatoes and grains and all this other stuff and can process it basically break it down into a sugar through our digestion process, um, and so we don't spit into the batches of beer anymore. Um, <laughs> we just buy an enzyme. Well, you try not to. I mean, I've never been in a brewery like. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't. We I've been in a brewery. Like, there's no enzyme uh, needed to be actually bought either. Really? Yeah. The the grain that's it has cool. that enzyme on it mm -hmm. already, just naturally. Yep. It's natural. It's natural. So it's you just natural. soak the grain in a crap ton of water, and that's what you do. Is that's what you're doing. Um, it's it's the mash. So the mashing process, you're taking all the grain, you dump it into a vat of really hot water, um, not not boiling. Um, but like really hot water and you let it sit for a certain amount of time and that's what's happening right there is, is the enzymes are breaking down the sugars uh, right. from complex sugars into simple sugars and the reason you're doing that is so the yeast can, can get at those sugars a lot easier and once all that is done you know you do it for usually I, I feel like I remember it's about an hour or so <clears throat> you can go longer for different beers or shorter for other beers um, but you're creating the, the fermentable sugars the breakdown of it in that mash once you've done so you've used a giant amount of a big amount of water to to basically prepare to create you create wort to kind of soak that grain you yeah you, it's like tea gotcha you soak that grain and red what tea. it's doing is it's yeah yeah red tea barley barley tea yeah pre-beer pre-beer <laughs> wort <laughs> oh. lots of names um so then you drain that wort off into a boil into into or into a you don't drain it into a boil. What the heck? That's gross. Uh, <laughs> Not that kind of boil. <laughs> you you go and you transfer that into your your um, your boiler, and your get, kettle. Your kettle. Thank you. I don't know why I couldn't remember that name. I only <laughs> did it forever. Um, and then you boil that down uh, to the to the amount that you want. Um, part of that process for boiling is also to add products such as hops. That's when you add the boiling hops to create mm. bitterness. At different times so then you're draining that or transferring that out into your fermenter but it's boiling hot like literally boiling hot and so you don't want to put throw in your yeast into boiling hot water and no. they all die. Yeast, they all die. yeast like temperatures that are you know around 100 degrees yes yeah, human temperatures yeah, human temperatures yeah uh, so you have to cool that down now here's where a lot of the water use is human done temperatures. <laughs> A lot of the water use in breweries that are of a certain size, this is where they use a huge amount of water. Washing the grain. Mm, is that what that's called? No. Oh, dang. <laughs> um, chilling that wort. Oh, because you're dumping in fresh cold water and cycling it around with it? You are running the wort through a, pl through a plate chiller and then running cold, as cold water as you kind of can through the other side of the plate chiller. And so it's not ever like diluting it, but it's coming into contact with that cold. How can it? How chilled? Are we talking like like need like a, like a chiller? Uh, no. Or is it just like well, like, not here. 
Here well, in Flagstaff, we don't. In Phoenix, they actually have to, uh, because the water comes out of the ground in Phoenix, like already warm. At 100 degrees. <laughs> yeah, not quite 100 degrees, but yeah, yeah very oh, warm. It's going to be close. It was 120 <laughs> the other day. Well, so groundwater and stuff, and out of the pipes, it's, it's warm. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's not cold. I get, my, so, I get my water from a well at home, and I think it comes out of the ground at about 55. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so here it's delicious. When I was brewing here, we didn't need. We just turned on the cold water tap. And it was cold arsenic. enough. <laughs> God, <I'm sorry. laughs> so Evan doesn't have too much longer with us. <laughs> He's drinking arsenic well water. It's delicious. Um, so anyway, it, where we were brewing here, we used to turn on the cold water, and that's cold enough to cool it down. Down in Phoenix, they have to actually they have a separate tank specifically to chill the water to run it through the oh chiller. Gosh. Yeah, so. Why I said so they use two chillers, one to control fermentation temperature, and then one to just chill the water down to, to. Yeah, it's a cold water tank or a cold water kettle, um, and so yeah, glycol could be used. That's an interesting question, actually. I don't think many breweries of like a smaller size, like craft breweries, it's expensive. Use a glycol chiller. Yeah, they're super expensive. I mean, they use a glycol chiller, or they use a chiller to cool the water, but they still use water to we, run through the plate. We just chiller. replaced. We just replaced. We just replaced ours, so I know that they're. Uh, yeah, that's an expense. Yeah, a little bit. No, so. All right, so, so basically the story is you take your cold water, you run it through the plate chiller, you run the wort through the other side of the plate chiller. Um, so I remember just sitting there watching water, like full blast, come out of the chiller after going through there. And it's really hot when it comes through. It's crazy. It come, goes in cold and it comes out like steaming hot because mm. of the energy transfer. That's why I need those, those rubber boots. Because you're going, yeah, seriously. To pr- oh, I burned the crap out of my foot one time. Mm-hmm. There's a photo somewhere. It's like blistery and boiled all over. Because yeah. oh, those boots are great if you if you wear them. put your pants on over the top of them. Oh yeah, if you put your pants yeah, because those inside and just yeah. it becomes a f- cup. Oh, no, <laughs> um, a cup of Nick foot tea. I wasn't actually wearing my boots that day. It went right through my shoes. Oh um, yeah, OSHA. OSHA. Um, so so anyway, you you got boiling hot wort and you need to cool it down so it comes in there at like. <clears throat> It's not boiling temperatures here in Flagstaff because we're at elevation, but it was like 185 or something like that. So it goes in there, comes out at like 55 or 65, something like that. It's been a long time. Anyway, you're sitting there watching. So as much wort is going in, you're using to dump out, gotcha. to, to chill. Now, I do want to say that larger breweries can afford to have systems where they recapture that water right. and can use it in other processes because it's hot water, so it's great. You can recapture it, use it for cleaning, all that stuff. Being sustainable costs money. And yeah, so it does. not we weren't in a position in our craft brewery to recapture, have the machinery to recapture and reuse that. So, um, so I just want to say that because like some breweries can be way more water. Oh yeah, some some of them even capture the CO two off gassing from the fermentation. Yeah, and then use that CO two to carbonate their batches. Awesome. We'll give a shout out to Mother Road. Yeah, you know, like that's they have an awesome system there. Yep. That, that does exactly that. So they're carbonating with the off gas from fermentation. Yeah. Which is really cool. <laughs> Reusing yeast yeah. parts. But it only costs them, you know, whatever, $150,000 oh, or something. So yeah, something. Not there yet. Yeah. So, so that's one aspect in a brewery. Um, I'll go through kind of some, uh, real quickly, uh, the cleaning difference that I saw here versus there. Um, brewing beer is a very, um, I'll call it dirty. I just mean it's like, it, it, the tanks, because of the hops that are added um, and such, oh, I, I, yes, another, <laughs> another bottle. I mean, I always keep a sneaky bottle on hand, <laughs> just in sneaky case. Sneaky bottle, sneaky bottle, opening up a sneaky bottle. Man, we haven't freestyled in a while. Oh. Remember when we used to get requests? <laughs> I do. So anyway, cleaning. Um, oh, gosh. Polish that Caledonia. That was good. I really like that Caledonia. So Oh my gosh, yeah. I can really taste... I, I like that I can taste the honey profile on it, too. Um, the vanilla is there. The tea is there to dry out on my tongue, but I can taste that honey, and it is different than orange blossom, for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, what happened? Something there? just happened. Yeah, verify to continue. Oh. Like it wants to make sure you're still alive. Yeah. Cool, we're back. Oh, 
Got some questions? Infrastructure and square footage that is required for the barrel aging. Is that Nick? Uh, no, that is Eli. I don't know who... Have you guys looked into vacuum... Oh, yeah. Oh, Eli. I think Eli has been on the live when I've gone live on TikTok. Um, <clears throat> hello, Eli. Yeah. Um, we'll get to that question here in a second. Cheers, Eli. Skull. Um, so the cleaning is a huge part, too. I remember um, it, it, just the muck, kind of. Um, i trying to use better words than muck and dirty. But like the hop residue <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the, the film that's left on the fermenters is is actually very hard to clean off after you're done brewing beer. Uh, compared to mead, it's is it, crazy. Different. Is it the protein in the grains? Like what is it? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a good call too. I don't know. I don't. I don't know exactly. I just know that it leaves a ring, and that like is needs to be either scraped off, right? Right. To clean something, you either use elbow grease, like physical, like a lot of physical energy, or you use very hot caustic. Right. Eventually, it becomes you have to use this hot caustic. And by caustic, it's like basically very, very, very strong soap kind of thing, a cleaner, cleaning agent. And so you, we would run a caustic cycle on the fermenters, which basically goes into a, what's called a CIP, clean in place ball, and spins around and shoots out this hot caustic to get that stuff off. Um, and then that would just dump down the drain. And so I was very surprised here at the meadery we hose it down just a little bit and put a little bit of elbow grease in it, but it's so much cleaner of a fermentation. It's easy. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> we don't get that. Because we don't have Krausen, right? Like, that's probably where a lot of that ring comes from is, is Krausen. Yeah, the fermentation of the, pro the protein sitting on top of the foam, basically. Right, right. And mm -hmm. that's like the, the, the foam that occurs that. in beer fermentation is called Krausen. Yeah. Um, I'm throwing a little extra German accent. And when you're brewing a sour beer, it's called sauerkrautzen. Sauerkrautzen. Oh, and you put it on your on your strudel. <laughs> oh no! Don't put it on the strudel. Put it on the bratwurst. <laughs> Isn't it crazy we can like do that with German accents and be totally fine? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Krautzen. <laughs> My name is Krautzen. Oh, okay. That Sorry. thing is in a terrible spot. I know. I know. I gotta. I'm not gonna adjust it. Um. Mm -hmm. So, so I just want to say, like production-wise, that is actually a factor too. The water use. I've seen so minimal water use here yeah. uh, in cleaning and and that part of production in the meadery. Insane, insanely minimal here. Yeah, it's pretty small. Yeah. Um, the batches don't make that much of a mess for the most part. No. And let's do the number. What's it? Kyle, Kyle Rizdal. Kyle Rizdal. No, Kyle. Rizdal. Kai Rizdal. Kai. Oh, yeah. man. Kai Rizdal, like he says, Ooh, that means let's sneaky. do the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> so for uh, on the production side, we've got for one for each gallon of beer, one gallon of beer, it takes three to seven gallons of water. All right. And these numbers are like big deal compared to the agriculture ones. <laughs> but we're just talking about production side. So cleaning, um, chilling, all that. What's a, what's BA in your footnotes here? Oh, uh, Brewers Association. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so these numbers come from Public Policy Institute like of California you, and the Brewers Association. For all of these, whether you're talking the, the beer or the wine, like you got the numbers from the people who know what they're talking about. I try to, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Oh, I forgot we were drinking. I took a sip and I was like, what is up with that? That is that not is, the Caledonia. That's not the Caledonia I We're know. drinking a traditional. Do you want to talk about this traditional real fast? We could. I was thinking about it. Yeah. Because we are jumping ahead in... Uh, in bottle lot numbers. Yeah. Um, We're not there yet. This is this is actually not a traditional that is out in public right now. Not available for everyone. Yeah. Um, but Keep it is, that. It is delicious. Yeah, it is. And We're gonna we'll we'll do a whole episode about it. Let's do. Yeah. yeah. People will be interested about that. They will. We can no longer say we don't back sweeten. Just as a little teaser. Yeah. I mean, we still mostly don't. We still mostly don't. Ninety percent. But this new trad. Mm. Oh, mm. Wow. Good. I hope people like it. I think they will. I think they will too. It's really good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So each one gallon of beer is three to seven gallons of water. Mm -hmm. For wine, we've got for every gallon of wine, you use six gallons of water. And this production. is separate from our from our ag numbers. Right? Yes, yes, yes. This is only in the where in the in the brew house, if you will. So the production numbers are a lot smaller than the ag numbers. Way smaller. Yes. Yeah. Which makes sense because for like, everyone else but us. Yeah. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> yeah, ours actually goes the opposite, which is yeah. kind of funny. It is interesting. Yeah, so uh, this is not to produce the grapes or anything like that. So from, uh, again, Union College of Sustainability and Sonoma County Gazette, you've got six gallons of water for every gallon of wine. For whiskey, I did get the numbers on this one. Um, 37 gallons of water for every one gallon of whiskey. 37 gallons doesn't sound like a lot, but like, that it, that's, that's... I feel like it's probably even more than that. Yeah, because that's like six times as much as beer. But I'm, I'm taking into account the fact that you're basically making an 8% alcoholic beverage, and then you're boiling off 92% of that beverage, damn near, um, to get... Because like what the... Right after you run it through the still, you have what's called barrel strength. Um, you can definitely purchase some scotches and whiskeys and whatnot out there that are mm -hmm. barrel strength. Mm -hmm. And they usually... I mean, when they're when they get finished with the distilling portion of things, they're usually looking at you know 170 proof. Uh, you divide that by two, and you get whatever your alcohol content number is. Um, whereas, like you know, most of the things that you're drinking are like 80 proof, um, as, as like most whiskeys are around 80 proof, around 40 percent alcohol content. Um, and so you're looking at you know, mm, let me divide those numbers real fast, but like there's a lot of cooking out of liquid and that's oh, yeah. all that distillation is doing is burning off water yeah that's it yeah yeah you're that's all it does yeah you're trying to get to that because water or uh, alcohol and water um, evaporate at different temperatures, at different temperatures. Right. so you're just alcohol trying to get rid like of the water 160 to 170 I think is like the sweet spot somewhere in there yeah. um, so kind of you're getting rid of the alcohol but you're recapturing the yeah, you're getting rid of it and then recapturing <laughs> it, and then whatever is left after you're done with your distillation process is not reused or anything. I mean, that's just going down the drain. Yeah. So I don't. So yeah. So you think it's it's different? Um, I think it could be. Think it's higher than thirty-seven gallons. Um, but we'll, after drinking a bottle and a half of mead, I <laughs> am making the assumptions. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, from the Beverage in Industries Environmental Roundtable and the KPPC. Uh, oh God, I use I. I remember what that stood for when I did this talk before, but I don't remember now. Um, 37 gallons to one gallon of whiskey, we'll say, con sounds conservative to Evan. Mm -hmm. Cool. But still, that's still a lot. I'm judgy. I mean, that is still, you're looking at, you know, 10 time, ten or more times the amount of, as beer. Yes. Um, so. Well, yeah. I guess when you actually, when you say it that way, that probably makes sense. Oh, okay. Beer at 8%, whiskey at 80%. So it would take 10 times as much. So I, I yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, anyone have that feels information, fair. email me, nick at drinkinghornmeadery.com. Um, if you have any resources that we can use, I would love to, to hear it. So. And you can email me at info at drinkinghornmeadery.com. <laughs> yes. That's also Nick's email address. <laughs> it's got like eight email addresses. Um, okay, and then so for mead, um, for one gallon of mead, it takes one to two gallons of water. I'd say it's closer to the two-gallon side. I would say it's closer to two gallons. Yeah, but it's so crazy that that's like the thought is like, it could it could potentially us making mead back there could be less than twice the amount. Because it's about we use about a yeah fifty to one hundred gallons. So per batch we have a hundred fifty gallon batch. We use like fifty to one hundred gallons for cleaning and sterilizing the tank before putting the mead into it. Um, and then our super secret process to get it to shelf stability um, takes about 120 gallons. Okay. And then cleaning it takes about another 50 gallons at the end of it. So I, I, I would say two. Yeah, I would say two. I, sure. I was thinking about that the other day when I was looking at our super secret um, shelf stability, as you called it, yeah. uh, system, and I was like, oh yeah, I think that is about two yeah. two gallons to every one gallon of meat. I would, I would even be willing to go at uh, 2.5 to 3. 2.5 yeah. to 3, yeah. Because I think it, you could, and it probably depends on the batch, depends on, you know, sometimes the fruit gets in there, it's a little more sticky, it takes a little, it takes a little more effort to rinse out. Yeah. Again, I, I want to reiterate that when we're looking at mead numbers... 
it, this, these numbers are not out there. So I, I don't even have a reference to that because I'm using us as the reference. Because yeah, there aren't any you numbers. Cannot, you can't search it. No. We're no. not. Meat is not common enough yet that like anybody has done studies on this. Yeah. Like we worked with the the Davis, uh, UC Davis, to come up with like the first pallet wheel for meat. <laughs> um, Can you explain pallet? I almost just choked on the traditional. Can you explain pallet mead? Uh, Drink it. Don't breathe, Nick. Drink it. <laughs> uh, so a pallet wheel just takes you from... It, it kind of helps you quantify, if that's the way you want to think of it, um, what you are tasting. So as you drink something, um, you kind of work your way outwards from this pallet wheel. It'll have kind of a center spot of me drinking. And then as you taste things that are in it, you can kind of work, all right, I'm tasting this, and then I'm tasting that, and then I'm tasting that, and then I'm tasting that. Um, which for like a sommelier's interest would just be to be able to describe it to someone. Um, for someone who is producing it for our production interests, um, you can use that flavor profile and that flavor wheel um, that people have determined where your product is sitting at to um, augment and change your recipe to come up with something that you like even more than what is currently on the table. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, if, yeah, flavor profiles. Flavor like, profile. That would be yeah. Like, yeah. Like, uh, what are some of, there's some weird one, like cat urine is actually a, a wine one. Oh. Like, yeah. Toasted uh, weasel? Dirty socks mm. is another one. Is that a good one or a bad one? <sighs> I don't know. I have, a hard, I have a hard time with traditional wine, like uh, description kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's rugged. We tend to, we do tend to poke a little fun at it. Right. So the basis of saying that is like we are working with other people to try to figure out things about me because it's so, you know, it's, it's funny. It's the oldest beverage, but it's also very new. It's like it disappeared yeah. for a little while and it's coming back. Well, you know where you see that sort of same, like that similar sort of pattern with stuff is where, when something was so common that nobody really thought that you needed to write anything down mm. about it. I think that's almost a little throwback right. to our Laura conversation. Yeah, a little bit. A little yeah. bit where it was so common. But at the same time, like what you hear a lot about me is that it was like it was the drink of kings, the drink of gods. Um, so it definitely was not like necessarily available to all classes within a society either. So hmm. I don't know. Just kind of interesting. But maybe it's not so much that it was so common that nobody needed to write anything down about it. But that mead had been so popular for so long, even if it was just for like the aristocracy or whatever within a society, that similar sort of thing, not necessarily common with all the people, but something that it was like, yeah, why would I write down a book about how doors are made? Yeah, yeah. That's stupid. Yeah, it's yeah. a door. Yeah. Like, how push, do you, how, why would I write a, a manual about how to brush your teeth? Although I do do a lot of pulling on push doors, but like, that's my own special. That's my own special thing. Oh, man. Um, cool. So, yeah, so this is new, or not new information, but this is, this is information that we might get more on later, but for us, our experience is, uh, sounds like two to three gallons. I'll give it two to three. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking close to beer, but just a little bit under. Um, as far as the actual as, production. As far as production. Which doesn't feel right when you, when you say it that way. It doesn't, right? Because yeah. we don't use, like, I mean, I've, I've been in breweries for collaborations and stuff, and, like, it's not. It's, we don't use anywhere close to what we're using. No, I think the three on that, three to seven for beer, is probably the ones that we use their chiller water. Cause they're, let's, let's give it a solid 2.1. Okay, cool. Beautiful. <laughs> um, but either way, agriculture is the biggest. Right. Yeah, the upstream so. upstream yeah. costs, as I would call them. Yeah. I don't know if that's a fish term or... No, no, no. Upstream. Is that, a, is that an ag term? No, any, any kind of production of something, there's upstream mm -hmm. and downstream. Yeah, for sure. I feel like it's especially applicable to water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it just sounds right. Battling brooks. Battling brooks. Cool. Um, yeah, so again, we're not trying to bash any of the <laughs> other ones, at least I want to say that. Um, but if you are interested in water conservation, uh, your choices, you know, we're all told to turn off the water faucet when we brush our teeth. <laughs> but if you want to make a bigger impact, um, there's lots of things to do. And I think something that people should think about or at least is good for people to think about is their choice of beverage yeah and although i definitely believe you should be conscientious of your of your municipal water use um the vast majority of our fresh 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 <laughs> our fresh water use is in production and manufacturing yeah 
I want to say it's like 90% of our freshwater use usage oh is gosh, in yeah. manufacturing and production and stuff like that. Yeah. So like, oh, by all means, don't, don't leave that water running while you're brushing your teeth like some sort of numb nuts. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But you should also be thinking about what you intake, what you put in your body. That's why I started off with that, that story about the wheat is because I wanted to see like how much land does Evan need to eat the way I eat right now, right? Yeah, each, each, each American, it's crazy. I, used to I think I that. calculated it out at somewhere around 30 acres of wheat. Yeah. You know coffee, you know how much coffee one coffee tree produces on average? I have no idea. One pound. One coffee tree produces one pound in its lifetime? Per year. Oh, per year? Per year. Are they multiple, Annual. are they annuals? Yeah, yeah. Because they're like per a tree. It's like, like a tree tree. tree. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, one pound per tree. Yeah. I use a lot of trees. Dude, that's what I'm saying, right? Oh so if you look at, all right, so I need 30 acres of wheat for him. He's got his Woo coffee cup. He's showing to the camera because... I drink a lot of coffee. Oh, Even though it's not Woo Wednesdays. Not. It's not Woo Wednesday, but... But it'll still roll. But like, you know, so, okay. Kelly and I go through, my wife and I go through, I don't know, we have, we have family living with us again. Um, but like, I think, I think she and I would go through maybe a, about a pound a week. I don't know. I don't know where that sits with other people's. We're not the best about like reheating the cold coffee. Not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> Just make a fresh cup. Fuck, I'll do it. I <laughs> um, That's okay. Uh, you make mead. You yeah. save water. Yeah, I'm saving water every day. Yeah. Um, save so water every day. It's just kind of so. All right. Now I need. Now I need what? Fifty-two coffee trees. <laughs> and I need sixteen acres, thirty acres of wheat. And then, like, that doesn't even include, like, some of the rest of the stuff. So I, I, I kind of calculated it out, like, a rough number. And, like, for my current lifestyle, I need something like 150 acres for me. That's so scary. But I, I eat a lot of meat and that other stuff, too. You yeah. know what I mean? And, I, and I'm not eating a lot of chicken. Not going to lie. I love my red meats. Um, but they're not, they're not, you know, they're not good on water either. Um, so that's, I use, I use an absolutely exorbitant amount of land for the way that I feed myself yeah i think yeah your point is well taken that like turning off the water while you brush your teeth is really like not what you need to be focused on it's a little bit of greenwashing yeah so i want to take that but we should all take things into consideration yeah 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 for your pocketbook too yeah yeah um i think and we're not going to go into this because but there's more to talk about with water as like what like what you're talking about um i used to tell my students Water is energy, and energy is water. You cannot separate them whatsoever. And so another part, <laughs> going down a rabbit hole here. No, I like it. I'm following you. You cannot separate water from energy and energy from water. And so when we talk about mead and agriculture and specifically our product, we get all of our honey. Oh, man, there's two forks to go down, so stay with me here. One of them is we get our honey from Arizona. So there is very minimal transportation right. to us. Whereas, like I said before, in the brewery, sure, you could use local grain, but most likely here in the West, you're not getting your grain from here. It's coming it's in on either, a ship. It's coming in on a ship or at best from the Midwest. Right. The transportation... Yeah, because we don't, we don't even grow a lot of grain here in Arizona. No. No, it's a, uh, grain, is, grain, is, grain, no it's, grain is definitely yeah. a Midwest. But a lot of it is coming from a ship. When you think about <clears throat> energy as far as like oil production, electricity production, mo- transporting um, that, kind of, that kind of infrastructure, it actually takes a lot of water yeah. to do that as well. And so you could um, go through that whole process uh, of manufacturing oil, like creating oil. Like it'd be great if it just came out of the ground and you were like, oh, throw it right in your fucking ship or your car or your Filter train. out the rocks and call that <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, but it takes a ton of water to produce, uh, you know, a kilojoule of energy. Yeah. Um, and then we also, I won't talk about this, but I'm talking about it now, we do not use any fertilizers, not directly, to produce our product. Um, right. And we do not use pesticides. Right. The creation of fertilizers and pesticides is very water intensive as well. Well, and so like some people out there might be like, I'm not that green. I'm not thinking about that. Like that's not, you know, my sort of thing. And like think of it this way, because like this is kind of where I come from. Is that like, I'm a 
I'm a bit of a redneck that likes the idea of not having to rely on other people. Mm -hmm. Right, like I, I like being thinking about ways that I can rely on my own self and my mm -hmm. own systems and my own way of doing things. Don't mind nobody's business but my own, sort of the situation. And you should still be thinking about conservation, just simply for the 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 idea that like I mean the original conservation groups were hunters. Yeah, yeah. Because they're the ones that want to see that sort of a thing continue with stuff. Yeah. So it's a, we don't want it to be like this is a, a divisive thing, something that turns people away in one direction or the other. Um, it's simply just there's a lot of humans out there and the, the less of an impact we can have on it the more we can have yeah yeah I mean you, if you don't want a system to break down then make it as simple as, as you can absolutely and keep it super simple keep it simple and if you the kiss. less hands kiss keep it simple stupid the less <laughs> hands or the less functions involved in a system um, the better the, the, the less likely it is to break down I think that's kind yeah, of yeah absolutely like, if you want to you know, simplify it to where like you have more control over it, and put less into it. So, yeah, yeah. Um, just another kind of point uh, of water use. We uh, fertilize uh, pesticides are. Boom. I know it was so deep. Pesticides um, are not only like not used in honey production; they're detrimental to it because yeah. pesticides kill pests, and mm -hmm. and that is an insect, and bees are insects. And any any poison is a, a. Uh, oh man, I just lost the word for it damn you mead um, <laughs> any poison is sort of a, a broadcast killer oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, you, it's not, you, it's you not a specified like thing like, and right like I've, I've got a an animal around my house right now that I am trying to remove oh, and I'm not going to use a poison to do it I'm going to use a trap because I know exactly when this animal comes out I know exactly what it's going after and I want to use it to specifically target it um, whereas poisons are our, our general kind of general killers which is not great because they also kind of go through the the whole food chain and build up into your eagles and <laughs> oh. turkeys things like that yeah don't kill those yeah don't kill those did you have more questions no uh, TikTok looks like it's almost like paused possibly or something I don't did know it kick us no it we're, got tired we're of still, us we're it still got tired going. of us opening alcoholic balls with axes and I'd, kicked us off no we're not kicked off I think unfortunately we're just not interacting with it Mm. as much and so people aren't aren't coming on for it but uh, that's fine we're using it for video anyway so we can yeah. get clips of this but cool well uh any other final thoughts on on water save water drink mead save water drink mead yep. ride a cowboy yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i do want to point out that you see it on the back of our shirts some of our shirts that save water drink mead when i post it up <gasps> you're save wearing water, it drink today mead. too is it no nope no. just kidding all you mean is love that's all you mean is love um but when we say that, we're not just being kitschy, like, like save water, drink, you know, you hear right. it, save water, drink beer, like, it's just basically, it's like, haha, you know, beer is awesome. Right. But we actually have, like, quite a bit of meaning behind it. Save yes. water, drink me is not just, like, a kitschy saying, it's, it's actually talking about the truth, like, what we feel is the truth, if you want to save water, um, make me part of your lifestyle. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, we did a pretty damn good job of covering that. That's, I'm trying to save water for boating. There you go, yeah, yeah. save water so you can boat more. Yeah. <laughs> save boating, drink me. There you go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Uh, we need our reservoirs to stay filled up. and uh, yeah. yeah, so it may not seem like a big deal to choose mead instead of another alcoholic beverage, but I think it, it would make an impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Every little choice matters. If you guys have any further questions about this... Um, do not hesitate to ask us. We love the engagement. We love um, giving this information. Um, and if you have information about this that we didn't talk about or if we said anything, you know, kind of off or, or wrong, yeah. let us know too. I can get a little <laughs> preachy. Yeah. <laughs> so we will uh, we'll take all those uh, info at drinkinghornmeadery.com or nick at drinkinghornmeadery.com or you can, you can send a message on any of the socials as well. Uh, it'll get to us. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe so it can go out to many, many more people. We can spread the, the good word of mead. Um, and you can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all, all the... We're basically on every podcast platform yeah. out there. Um, you can find us, subscribe, uh, share it with people who would love this information. That's actually probably the best. Yeah, share, share it with somebody else who's interested in water. Yeah. Share it with somebody who will piss them off. 
you know, just for sure. Yeah, yeah why not? Like that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any engagement's good. If and you uh, like it, share it with your friends. If you didn't like it, share it with your enemies. Ooh, okay. either way. I like that. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> new uh, new slogan. Maybe that'll be on the back of a shirt. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future shows, um, send it our way as well. Uh, we would love to have have y'all a part of this. Uh, leave us a voicemail. I want to hear voicemails. We would love voicemails. I want to hear drunken voicemails. Okay, here's the thing. If you're listening to this right now, first of all, good on you because it's an hour and a half long episode. Oh, uh, shit. I mean, I'll edit it down a little bit too much because all the information was great it's just been so long since we've been together on one of these yes mm. yes the mead helps us keep going too it lubricates our vocals <laughs> um, if you're listening to this right now i want you to put it in your calendar like in your whatever google calendar or reminders app to send a voicemail to speakpipe.com slash drinking horn it's so easy you don't have to download anything you don't have to do anything you just push a button you start talking and then you push the button again you can just say hi you can just say hi. Let us let us know if you want us to use it on on the air or not. Yeah. Um, if you want to keep it private, that's we definitely understand, um, and we do get private messages from folks. So yeah. so feel free. It's okay. It's boring. That way, Nick's sad. I want to use no, it on but, the podcast. But I would love to hear your interactions with Steph. And yeah. So please please by all means. It keeps us going. It does. It, it really does. does. When we hear people say like, "Oh, when's the next?" You know, when you're doing another meatcast episode, it like lights the fire. It does. Yeah, that's, so I gotta I gotta respond to a few emails from some of our listeners. Oh, so that's uh, nice. Yeah, send them our way. Uh, whether it's a comment, a uh, question, or like I said, uh, an idea for a future episode. Yeah, so. or just to tell us we're wrong. I mean, either. <sighs> yeah, we'll or, take it. Or just to be like, you know, like my grandma makes awesome cookies. I don't care. But I'm gonna want some of your grandma's cookies. <laughs> yeah, sweet. All right, all right. Let's uh, let's let's uh, cut it here. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming back on, Evan. Welcome back. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> it was great. Always a pleasure you. to yeah. be on the Drinking Horn Meadcast. Meadcast, 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 Meadcast. Skull, skull. Ha! Shave water, drink me. Shave water, drink me. That's all you Shave need. Water, drink me. Shave water, drink me. It's all I feel. drink me. Shave water, drink me. Shave water, drink me. We smoke a little weed. Ooh, I gotta write that down to edit. <laughs>